that's an excusable, right? But if you have something that comes in that's mixed, we're never going to get it 100%, you know, without a DNA test or without the owner being there telling us, yes, I saw this male and this female mate and that puppy came from them, right? So to some extent, that's not an intake park issue, right? <laughs> It's an imperfect system, and I do agree with that. Microchips mm -hmm. migrate. I've seen scanners go bad, and we didn't find out about it until it was, you know, we already scanned some dogs with it, and we had to go back and rescan those animals. Those things do happen. Those anomalies are going to come up, but I think those are exceptions and not necessarily. Which is, which is why we scan animals. In this particular case, uh, on Bark's website, which she checked on her phone en route to Bark, she pulled off the side of the road right before she got to Bark. It clearly establishes that on January. 3rd, 2013, Bark was not open Thursday morning for the redemption of dogs. It opened Unless that Unless you're there to find your animal, it's open to you all the time. It, it does say that on there. Well, and she called and it was confirmed we're not open to the public. Did she say she was looking for her animal? Yes, and was told, I find that hard to look believe. on I Pet Heart. It's I uncontroverted do. testimony in the case. Okay. It we're said look on Pet Heart, which she did. Right. She didn't even know what a Malinois was. So, um, we'll take a look at our website if we need to clarify. Well, I have the website as it existed. <coughs> it's what well, I'm understood, talking about. Understood. Not now. Understood. Over a year. If we, if we'll take a look at the website. If we need to clarify our address on the website so that it can be absolutely clear using whatever mechanism you want to use to get information about farm, then you get full information about all the different contingencies that might apply to a specific case. And information is present at the facility. I, I want to just talk about um, two other things that I think are more fundamental to your comments. Um, the, the stat regarding ownership, I think you said 93% of, of lost animals aren't we um, reunited with their owners or their owners. Over 99% for the first 10 months of 2013. Yeah, there's no way to develop that statistic um, and have it be reliable because the only animals that we can establish as owned are ones that have either. No, I said that we're actually redeemed by owners. The redemption rate by owners, according to your stats, say X number of dogs were redeemed during that 10 month period. X number of dogs came in. When you compare those two, you'll find that one half of 1% of them dogs no were doubt. redeemed. No That's doubt. not saying they didn't have owners that were in no, effect. I, I, think, I think that is an improper comparison to make and it is uh, it mis it's a misuse of that information. One, we have we're, the numerator in that case is our return, the number of animals that are classified as outcome as returned over. And the denominator in that case is animals that are just totally intact. And I wish that it were the case that the majority of animals that came to Bark were owned. But that is absolutely not the case. It can be more than the truth. There, there are still far too many that we know are owned because it can sit, it doesn't urinate or defecate in its pen, it's clearly been trained, but there is no ownership information for that issue. Sure. Now that's in too many cases, but it is, it is a mischaracterization of the information that we published to say that one half of one percent of animals um, or to imply that from the total intake number, any proportion of that, trying to allocate any proportion of that as owned is just a complete misuse of That's not what I'm saying. Okay, I'm good not deal. saying they're owned. I'm saying that they were redeemed. That's a difference. What I'm saying is that the vast majority of dogs that go into bark did not get redeemed by their owners. And, and my point is that saying redeemed did not Whether get redeemed by their owners not. implies that there was an owner to be redeemed. Yeah, and I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying. So we're clear. I, yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that those dogs are owned or not. I'm just saying that unfortunately, most of them don't have anybody looking for them that successfully claim, reclaims a dog. That's and the sad thing. That is sad. And the sadder thing is that the majority of them don't have anyone looking for them because they're not. Um, okay. But the, the and that's not thing, Bark's fault. I'm not indicting no, Bark no, at no, all. No, no, no. I don't think that. You, no, please I understand. The the fundamental thing. There's two fundamental issues that I want to speak to. Um, the first, you referred to the uh, 
what we have currently on our regulations, which is it, it provides that within 30 days of an adoption, um, we have in our local regulations that within 30 days of an adoption, if an owner comes forward, that person can redeem the adopted animal from the person that adopted it, provided that they agree to pay twice the adoption fee, any costs incurred associated with caring for the animal, medical fees, that type of thing. That is a direct contribution of state statute. Because, um, I believe it is Open Safety Code Section 826.0311 makes it unlawful for a person anywhere in the state of Texas to disclose the identifying information of the owner of a registered animal. Right. It is unlawful. A person commits an offense, any person in the state of Texas, if they disclose the identifying information of a pet that's been licensed. And we have we require pet licenses in Houston, and every animal that's adopted from Mark is licensed. So what we have, essentially, we've created with this, which and this was inherited, it was on the books when we took over Mark, that 30-day provision is something that we come up legally fulfilled. In fact, we're prohibited from fulfilling it. And what it does is it positions us and puts Mark into, what it really does is skew the expectations of the person that may have owned that animal, because it seems like Park can guarantee that you will get your dog back when the best thing that we can do legally is to act as a middleman and a negotiator between the adopting family and the person that previously owned the animal. There's nothing that we can do to compel an outcome in that case legally. Well, first of all, the ordinance doesn't say adoption at all. It says purchase. Right. It's talking about a purchase right. uh, and transfer to a third party because the ordinances are a patchwork of old laws and new laws no, no. and do not reflect common parlance or practice. Which is why we're okay, so the term I get it. and carrying that through. But, but, the, um, but the, the, the rabies provision doesn't have anything to do with what you're talking about, nor does it have anything to do with the Lyra case which precipitated all this, because the city of Houston gave the name of the person who pulled the dog and their number for the purpose of getting the dog back. And that was to a rescue organization. The dog had not been uh, sold by adoption to a third party. And so rescue organizations should be jumping up and down to return dogs to their rightful owners so they can pull one that's going to maybe get the blue solution. Right. Um, and so maybe this is something we can work on together to, 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 to have both concerns met. Perhaps. I, I think um, it, what it sounds like to me, number one, thankfully, this is a very remote occurrence. It is not a high probability event. You said, and I right. have no reason to doubt it, you said this, is, this happens to you. Um, and it also sounds like there are mechanisms to affect, to allow someone else to act as mediator over all the facts involved, and if something was done improperly, if the previous owner needs to have an animal reunited with it, it sounds like there is already a mechanism working to accomplish just that thing. Well, it's remote now, but if you empower organizations to act the way that this one did, then it, it would happen with greater frequency because most rescue groups do the right thing and give the a pet back to somebody and crying nothing, and begging for it. And nothing that we that we are recommending would prevent that from occurring. But, right, but, but the, uh, some of them take the hard-nosed view that too bad, too sad, my dog, screw you. And that's what this one did. Despite people crying and begging and offering money to get their dog back, no, we don't want to get it back. No, don't so want to. I'd, I'd like to talk about the second fundamental fundamental issue that I was describing before. And um, that is at the end of three days, or before three days, if an animal is suffering <coughs> mildly, we can put the animal down. Absolutely right. We can exercise humane euthanasia if an animal is suffering 
and euthanasia is the humane thing to do if it's been hit by a car, all various other type of circumstances that unfortunately too many of the animals that come into our care exhibit. Or at the end of a three day period, we can terminate the life of a dog or a cat. And when you terminate the life of the dog or the cat, the ownership interest of the dog or the cat is terminated with it. Um, now, all of the arguments, the legal arguments, and to us, that is a, that's just one of those things, how do we get around that? It, it doesn't, if we can put down a dog after three days, or before three days, if, if it's required medically, um, that is a difficult thing for us to overcome intellectually. If, if that is the case, then um, the rest of it is, I don't want to call it academic, because I think that could be construed as minimizing it, but there's common sense that I think ought to play a very large role in this discussion. And quite frankly, and to close this up, and then I think I'd, I'd just like to say I'd love to hear from you and see what other briefs you'd like to provide me. I'd sure. really love to see that. Um, there is, if we do not, what we care about is setting up a system and a structure in the city of Houston that provides for the highest probability humanly possible to encourage the greatest number of animals that come to bark to leave bark alive. Now, if there are things at the margin that need to be adjusted or addressed in different venues than in our ordinance provisions, then that is the entire reason for the judicial system's existence and for civil actions and, and litigation and that type. But we want to set up a system in which people can feel confident that when they adopt from Mark, they are adding a permanent member of their family. We want to set up a system in which the greatest number of rescue groups can feel the greatest degree of confidence that if they pull an animal from Mark, they can feel free to invest funds to rehabilitate that animal and get it ultimately adopted. If we don't have a system, in place that encourages that, that jeopardizes what we're trying to achieve with respect to a live release rate. And the reason that we care about that is that there is one place in the city of Houston where every employee of an organization can be expected to end the life of a living thing. And it's hard. And that is obviously an emotional burden to place on employees but <clears throat> make no mistake that it also makes management of that organization more costly than it otherwise needs to be because of the emotional burden, turnover at the facility and the employees is greater than it otherwise would need to be. People get sick more often. We have to rely on a greater degree of temporary labor, which is more expensive. And we need a budget for, for that, more importantly, to say nothing about the fact that Providing a system that encourages for the most animals to leave alive from Mark is the right thing to do. Now, providing a mechanism for, I think we also need to ensure that if an animal comes to us and we have evidence that it's owned, we absolutely should be expected to take advantage of every opportunity available to us to try to notify that owner that we have your dog or your cat, this is how you come get it. Which we have. And we've strengthened. Um, and, and I don't know how we get over, intellectually, how we get over the common sense, um, hi Sam, of at the end of the relevant hold period, we can end the life of a dog or a cat. To me, that's, that's this is uh, an academic exercise beyond um, discussions in various courts, not
But uh, that, that's I'll, it. That's it. I, would. I, I don't want to take a bit more time, but there's actually law on that, and I will discuss that with you. I'd love to see it. Although it's actually done. Let me see it. Without extinguishing an owner's rights. Euthanizing an animal? Absolutely. Uh, you can euthanize an animal without extinguishing owner's right. rights. You just euthanize the animal that belongs to person A. You extinguish the dog, not the rights in the dog. It's it's a moot question that Agreed. you're going to no 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 not what I just said. But that's very relevant. You extinguish the dog under the police power of the state. You're allowed to do that. It does not mean you extinguish the owner's rights in the dog. If there is an owner, an owner's dog just got put down. I, I have case law, and I'll show you. Well, Alexander, the, the ownership of property entitles that owner to the exclusive use and enjoyment of that property. That's the definition of ownership of property. If you euthanize an animal, you have terminated that owner's use and enjoyment of that property, and there's no other firmer way to do that than euthanization. So rights is just semantics. You've terminated the ability for them to use and enjoy their property, which by law only they can do. I understand your perspective from criminal law. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about case law in the civil realm regarding ownership, and we can talk about that later. Cool. I think everybody understands where kind of where everybody is. Right? Pretty much. That's pretty good. It's a good. Uh, it's a great discussion. It's a great I've discussion. It's a great discussion. For a long time, and I'm sorry. I'm just uh, passionate. Passion is important. I've got plenty of it. <laughs> I'm glad to, to share with you some of my passion in a positive way too. So, um, so I think unless anybody else has questions on what we're trying to do with respect to the transfer of title, that pretty much buttons up the, the relevant sections of our recommendations on that. So, anybody have any? Compared to that, I have a stupid question. <laughs> um, you're going to hold the dog for six days from the date the owner was notified by telephone, mail, or hand You know, you throw an envelope in the mail on Monday. Is it six days from the when it goes in the mail? For the reception. When it, when it goes in the mail. Or when the phone calls closed or the Whether or not they received the mail is the wrong. Interestingly, and, and Tim, Mike, and I, we actually experience this all the time in the park, and this has been one of my, my biggest beefs, is that there are animals that are brought in there, and Jared can speak to this, an animal's down in a cul-de-sac, and, and, and a kid running around the cul-de-sac says, I think that that dog belongs to that house over there. So an ACO might leave a note on that, on that owner's door saying, we think you have your dog at bark. Once there's a perception that that dog is owned by someone, now that dog gets placed in a special category of bark. He's no longer stray. And that dog can end up being there for two, three weeks. And we've seen that. We've had adopters <coughs> that are interested in that animal. <coughs> and I can name with one hand with a few fingers missing how many times I've ever seen somebody after getting that certified letter coming down and actually redeeming that dog. Yeah. And it's to me inhumane to keep a dog in captivity, especially if it's typically in the North Kennel, for longer, <coughs> longer, yeah, longer than that, when that dog can go to a home. And I would like to see uh, the ability for, I don't know if you have the manpower, I know it's tough, but if, if there's a belief there's an address that dog belongs to, how about someone going out there and actually making contact in person? And that way the ball starts right there. They don't need six days after that. Make confirmation, you're the owner, you're not the owner. And if we don't have an owner, it falls into the regular, you know, three-day uh, stray hole. Right. Um, I agree that's something that we'd like to be able to do. We don't have the manpower to, to do rigorous follow-up that we'd like to do, but we've got um, we've got plans for that too um, that we're putting together right now and we're going to be making a pitch to the same thing. But let me, let me just, <clears throat> are we good on your question? Okay. okay. There is something that can be done by all of the pet owners in Houston to never expose themselves to the consequences of this discussion. That is, Get the pet license that is required by law and get a microchip. If you do those two things, um, number one, 
the number of animals that come to BART that have obviously been owned because they know how to sit will have identifying information that we can use. And number two, you will know kind of who you need to coordinate with or who to call in the event that there's a problem with your Those are two steps that every pet owner within the 624 square miles that make up the city of Houston can take tonight or tomorrow to make sure that they've got the greatest probability available to them of being reunited with their pet. That's to say nothing about the fact that if everybody did that, um, Clark would have far more funds to do far more special projects to make a lot of what we're talking about completely unnecessary. Can we wake up and have time soon or what? <laughs> <laughs> we never said it. No, it's <laughs> not <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> Just a quick question, uh, going back to that point, and I'm, were you going to cover, and I, I'm not sure it came in a little late, were you going to cover section 6.90, licensing authority, back, kind of going back on that? 6-90? Yes, 6 point, or 6-90, yes. What's your question about? Uh, I mean, the, the I just, only other topic, the main topic that, just for the main topic, the only other main topic that I wanted to discuss tonight, um, since this is last in a series of stakeholder events we've had on this is hobby or, or confirmation reading. So, and it's, it's kind of agreeing what you said. I mean, we need we all need to license our pets. Uh, is what I'm seeing here is Bark is uh, deleting the authority to allow vets or anybody else to license. It, prior, that that was or that is the status quo. Correct. And what the the veterinary community has told us is they're not really interested in performing that. So. Um, performing that function for us. So if they're not interested in doing that, if they're not going to take advantage of it, yeah. why have the provision? Well, we, uh, I spoke to a vet a couple of days ago, and she was interested in doing it. But again, one of the problems was that she doesn't want it to, she doesn't want it to be uh, burdensome on her staff. Right. Uh, expensive as, as well, which is understandable. So is there, I guess my question is, is there something Bar can do or someone else can do to make, to get a program that's easily usable by vets, where they can go in there and it's, it's not going to be complicated, it's not going to take them a long time. Because to me, I think if vets at the point of the vaccination could uh, license pets, I think that would be less work for Bark and it would be better for pet owners. No doubt. They don't really, I mean, we've gone to, we've gone to every vet in the city and none of the vets really, I haven't had any of them that said that they want to license it. Day. So what we've done in, at the end of all of this is we'll take any document that the vets want to turn into us. If they want to turn us a piece of paper on a big chief tablet, they want to give us an Excel file, whatever they want to give us, we take it. It makes it as easy as possible for them to submit what we need. And we then pay our vendor to interpret these inf this information so it goes in the system. So we've done everything we can in order to make it easy for them to help us out. There was a uh we brought this function internal in November, yeah. uh, right, November of 2012. We had a, a third party running this and weren't satisfied with it for a number of reasons. Um, there was a module that, that we looked at that was specifically designed to enable vets to be able to sell. Go ahead. It was like a point of sale module where they can do it at the time of some other treatment and they can actually affect the sale of the license if they want to do that. And, and what we found was that there wasn't much interest in taking advantage of that. And and I think it, that's understandable from from the veterinary community's perspective because I mean, they, they don't want to be in a position where they can be perceived as acting as, I mean, what we've heard is acting as the tax man or the compliance <coughs> officer in the city of Houston, that type of thing. I think, I'll, I'll tell you what kind of our, our, our medium range vision for this is. I think it would be easier for not only vets, but also um, daycare facilities, groomers, that type of thing. More folks would be willing to talk about licensing and why you need to get it if we were able to market it in a positive way. Not a, not a compliance thing, right. but describe the benefits in a compelling way. We've got, um, we've got some preliminary work done on what a campaign like that would look like and the imagery that we would need to use and the messaging that we would need to use to do that, to include little stand-ups that could go in vet clinics. It's, I mean, what it is, it's like a golden retriever with a tag on it, and it's got a, a bark, a 
a purple heart and it says your pet's way home. Right? And it talks about the benefits and reuniting your pet and that type of thing. No. We need to, if you want to sell more things, you need to act like you want to sell more things and you need to promote it and then you need to advertise it and that type of thing and that takes funds. But that's definitely, I mean, most folks that are in business understand that that's an investment. It's not uh, an exuberant expense, right? It's just a necessary investment if you want to generate cash flows in the future. Um, this licensing, as we just finished discussing, isn't only about cash flows, right? It's, there's a lot of other benefits that it brings to bargains. Does that answer your question? Um, well, you no, know, it does. It does. I mean, it makes sense. But I guess why, why, why delete this when it could possibly use later? Well, I mean, maybe the technology comes so close. Everybody uses PayPal. I mean, people use uh, different methods of payment registration. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't need the statute to enable folks to be able to to sell the license because they would be in effect. Park remains the licensing authority, and if they're using a platform. That we make a bit, say we go back and, and bets do come to us no. enough to justify the cost and say we would like to take advantage of that module. Well, it's provided by BARD, right? So it's still, in effect, you're still getting your, your, we don't need this language here to enable vets to act as an agent in that manner if, if they so choose okay. to do so. That makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah? Yeah. Because we, we really did. We reached out, we went to every vet. We had someone actually go visit every vet in order to try to understand what their needs were. And we started, we had, we had a formal module to have them share, if you will. We had a model set up that they would get some sort of compensation if they wanted to do it. I didn't want to waste their time. You know, I thought that their time was valuable and if they were going to help us out, that we would give them a little kick back, you know. No one embraced it, not one back. Well, I think, as like you said, a lot of times this market is how it's presented to the vets. I mean, they're going to come, initially they're going to have negative connotations because they don't, they don't want extra work, they don't want extra cost. They don't want extra responsibilities. You're right. Uh, I think the burden is rightly on us. So to, to do that first, make it as easy as possible for them. And it, it needs to be, I mean, if we can, and I think it'll work. I think I think most folks in Houston that own pets are responsible, and they, they also will see the benefits of that. And when, you, when they understand that all the revenues stay in part to help other owners' pets, I think that's something that a lot of folks are just going to react to right away and see the benefit of doing it. I mean, pet park charities, it's, they enable a lot of good things just by having that. Do you want to donate one, two, three, four dollars at the end of those transactions, right? So I, I think rightly um, the burden ought to be on us to position it the correct way, and then we can talk about approaching the veterinary community and, and other right. other so, folks as well. Yeah. <coughs> but we don't. You still have the authority. But to do uh, that. we can do that without having this. Okay. Thank you. Um, should we talk about hobby? For confirmation, or, or, or do we need to talk about that publicly? Or, or? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, the language that I suggested is primarily what's here, yep. and we thank you for that. Um, and I don't need to discuss it if we don't have any. I'll, I'll just sum it up real quick for what I hope will be a very large potential audience that will be viewing this video on our um, what, what we've done, what we heard from the, the folks that are engaged in um, what we learned was a very important term, and that is uh, hobby or conservation breeding in the city were going to be covered under what was a commercial breeding license when we initially recommended that, that uh, non-commercial breeding be prohibited in the city. So they came to us with language saying that would rightly differentiate hobby type of breeding, which is pretty much engaged in breeding an animal for the furtherance of breed characteristics or breeding an animal for the purposes of using it kind of as a hobby. So, Doc, forgive me, I'm not familiar with all the different activities, but to show it in dog shows or to engage in agility activities like dog dogs and that. So we've just provided a mechanism that allows folks that are engaged in what we're calling, based on the input from you all, uh, hobby or confirmation. So that is a distinct license or permit that folks can get under our recommendations. And we also we keep the commercial breeding permit, and then rather than prohibit non-commercial breeding, which we thought we needed to do, we've modified that based on a lot of feedback to just permit it as non-commercial breeding permit. So we're good with that. Yes, ma'am. 
Do you think that would be much to curtail the indiscriminate breeding that people do, like two neighbors breeding their dogs together so they can, you know, sell some puppies if they're considered a non-commercial breeder? Um, I don't think that it would do as much as mandatory spay neuter would. I don't think it would do as much as making it unlawful to breed for non-commercial purposes. Although I think in the, the example you just gave, that's commercial activity, right? And they're required to get a commercial breeders program. Now the challenge to us is knowing about all those different activities and getting an animal control officer on the doorstep. Um, so this is not the non-commercial breeders permit, the commercial breeders permit is not nearly as extreme, intrusive a measure as mandatory spay neuter is or prohibiting non-commercial breeding altogether. Um, and there are reasons why we think that we ought not pursue mandatory spay neuter, at least not yet. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of the folks that need that that would run afoul of a mandatory spay neuter provision probably don't have the means available to them to have that animal altered. So I think <coughs> until we have widely available low or no cost spay neuter available that those types of folks can take advantage of, I don't think a mandatory spay neuter policy makes the best sense for Houston at the time. But what the non-commercial permit does, which we do like, is that it starts to internalize the cost of this activity. And the more that we can get people to feel and, and pay for the cost of indiscriminate breeding or purposeful breeding for non-commercial purposes, the better off we'll be and, and we, would, we should expect to see a reduction in activity to the extent that we can enforce it and we think we can enforce it. So it's not, it, it's definitely not we had our druthers, we would flip a switch and all that activity would stop tomorrow. Um, but we don't really have that capability available to us. So the next best alternative is to set up a system that, that encourages the activities that we want and discourages the activities that we don't want. And outside of prohibiting something, uh, the next best way to do that is to make the activities that we don't want, to make the people that are engaged in that so would people say In financial or not? So if people, for example, that post on Craigslist all the time that they have a, a continual litters of puppies for sale, um, they could be somewhat policed by bark. And that comes down, yeah, absolutely. And that comes down to a resource question, and, and one of the things that, that I know Jared and his uh, his colleague Chris would love to do is to have uh, a person that could that could be on, on call at night for Houston Police Department calls for service. And when they're not needed by the Houston Police Department, they can run through Craigslist and they can build leads for the guys who are going to be on in the day to go follow up with those places. Now, that's a resource issue. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about when we make our pitch to the mayor and city council about, about additional funding. I think that would do a lot to either help people comply with the licensing or maybe discourage them from just to stop doing that. We do too. Um, I, I fear that I'm not adhering to my power. Don't worry. Much more interesting than that. You guys don't Okay. I can run through the PowerPoint real quick just for an overview of anybody else that hasn't seen this before. Should I do that? <coughs> If we don't care, then we can just call us all and it's available online. Is there anything that anyone else would like to discuss? Yes, Are the licenses available now? And, and what about the licensing for uh, pet service facilities? Are those yeah. available now? So there, the licenses, which licenses were you referring to at the first part of your question? Uh, pet licenses? For breeders' licenses and if the commercial pet service licenses are available, say for channels or breeding So the, the, the commercial breeder's license or permit is available today. The commercial pet service facility, 
Um, permit isn't available because it doesn't exist yet. It won't exist until city council passes these recommendations. The current kennel license is still available. Correct. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the hobby breeder is not available. The hobby breeder isn't available either. Yeah. Nor is the non-commercial breeder. Those, both of those won't be available until city council votes on our recommendations. Has, has the fee been set for the uh, pet service facility licenses? Yeah, we we discussed. I don't remember where we landed. I think really? we. What? Fifty. Huh? Was it fifty or? Fifty. Huh? It's for the commercial. It's a hundred. No, no for, the, for the pet service. Pet service. The, I think it was 50, yes. Shops. Yes, ma'am. Went from 200 to 50. Yeah. Yeah, that's a deal. Yeah. Okay. Let me just say this real quick so they can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what we just discussed in the back of the room was the price. The, the price for a kennel permit, which we have right now, which we're recommending be converted into the commercial pet service facility, is $200. When the new commercial pet service facility permit is made live after council if, and take away, and I think this is a common sense thing that the city council will support. When and if that's authorized, the fee for that permit will be $50, which will be our recommendation. I was just going to ask, what is your uh, time frame? Uh, that's a good question. We intended to take this to the Public Safety Committee um, on next Tuesday, on the 28th, but we got bumped. So, uh, there are, yeah. That month to win. So we're going to go to the February meeting of that committee, which is the fourth, fourth Tuesday at 10 a.m. It should be. You know, it's February, Christy? Yeah, fourth, fourth Tuesday. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll let everybody know. 25th? Thanks, so. yeah. So the, the barring unforeseen circumstances, February 25th at 10 a.m. But we'll let everybody know, and this is why it's important that folks sign in because we use the second 